Luke 22 and verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. You know, we, uh, we go through the book verse by verse. And there's a reason we do that. It's because we don't want to miss anything. There are many churches that never go through a, a, never go through a book verse by verse. And the problem with that is that the preacher can get, or, get, or, get away with not preaching on certain subjects. If there's something he doesn't want to preach on, if there's something that he wants to ignore, he can just preach on whatever he wants to preach on. But if you're going through a book, you can't do that. You have to deal with everything that's there. And the thing is, if I were someone who just picked random past not random, but if I picked uh, different passages that I wanted to preach on, I probably wouldn't be preaching on this one. I, I wouldn't preach on this one unless I had to. And I have to, so I am. Um, and not because I'm trying to hide anything, but uh, it's difficult. Some difficult stuff that's going on here uh, as far as the relationship of the persons of the Trinity and the Incarnation and how it all works. There are things that are mysterious in the passage here, so I don't have all the answers. But um, in today's passage, what we have is, you know, in Isaiah 53, Isaiah described Jesus as man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And there are many things that made Jesus grieve in his 30 plus years on earth. But uh, his greatest sadness and grief came on this night. In fact, in Matthew and Mark, if you read the parallel passages, he turns to his disciples and he says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. He, he is so sad this night that his sadness almost kills him and and this is why this is why the passage is so difficult for me because what Jesus is going through here it, Jesus is suffering and is dying on the cross is completely unique no one else in the history of the world went through what Jesus went through and you'll say what are you talking about, Jesus, uh, Nico? I mean, uh, Jesus, um, uh, there are thousands of people who have been crucified. So what's the difference? Well, none of them were sinless. None of them were bearing the sins of the world when they died. And so Jesus' death on the cross is totally unique. No one in the history of the world had the kind of death that Christ had. And so no one in the history of the world has had the kind of suffering that Jesus has before he is crucified. So, I had some trouble this week getting, getting through the passage, but um, we will do what we can. So, uh, let's remember the context, what's going on. We've seen Jesus and his disciples in the upper room during the Last Supper. And verse 39 says, Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. So you got Jesus, plus 11 disciples. Judas is not with them right now. Judas is off finding the people who are going to come and arrest him. So Jesus and 11 disciples, they leave the upper room. It's, it's dark. It's nighttime, probably midnight-ish. 
They're in a house which is in Jerusalem, so they leave the city. Remember we talked about this before, you got Jerusalem is on a hill, and then right opposite it is another hill, which is the Mount of Olives, in between is the Kidron Valley, which is about a mile to get from the city to, to the Mount of Olives, it's not far. So, middle of the night, they leave Jerusalem, and they're heading to the Mount of Olives. In Matthew and Mark, we are told that they went to a place that was called Gethsemane. Uh, John tells us that it was a garden, so you get the garden of Gethsemane. Um, Gethsemane, for those of you who are interested, means uh, olive press. <laughs> it's, it's such a pretty name. I hear Gethsemane. That's such a nice name. It means olive press, because it's the Mount of Olives. They had a place where they made the oil. Um, so, it says that he went there with his disciples in the middle of the night. It says he went as he was accustomed. Why is this important? This is very important. In John 18, we are told why this is important. Because since Jesus was accustomed to going and spending the night there, Judas knew where to find him. Okay? So, I mean, in the past, Jesus had often evaded situations where he may get arrested and killed. Because it wasn't his time yet. He knew when his time was to die. And so, if the situation was going to be too, di too difficult, too dangerous, he would just avoid the place. But now, it is his time, and so he goes and sits at the place where he knows he is going to be found and arrested. John chapter 10, Jesus said, No one takes my life from me. Remember that. We've said this many times before. Jesus said, No one takes my life from me. I lay it down at my own accord. In, in Hebrews chapter 10, there's this, there's this quote from the Old Testament where there's this discussion between the son and the father. And the son says to the father, uh, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. But a body you prepared for me. What's that about? He is saying that God prepared a human body. Jesus became flesh and blood. A human body and he came to die. That's why, that's what the incarnation is about. If you want a Christmas sermon, here's the Christmas sermon. Okay? The purpose of the incarnation, the reason Jesus became a baby, was so that we could have a human being who would die in place of other human beings. Jesus was born to die. That's the purpose that he came. And so, it's his time now. Up until this point, it wasn't his time to die yet. But on this Passover, he is going to become the Passover lamb, and he is going to die. He knew that Judas was going to come and bring people to arrest him. He knew that. He could have gone anywhere he wanted on this night and they wouldn't have found him. But he goes to this place knowing that he's going to get caught. Verse 40 says, When he came to the place, he said to them, as his disciples, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now Jesus is going to have a unique night no one else has had no one else is going to go through what Jesus is going to go through but his disciples also to, not nearly to the extent of Jesus of course but his disciples also are going to go through a very difficult night themselves and their faith is going to be severely tested and so Jesus says pray pray for yourselves pray that you do not come into temptation and one amazing lesson here is that Jesus is in the most difficult situation of his life. Jesus is having the most intense suffering of his life. And yet, he is still concerned about the spiritual well-being of his disciples. Usually, when we're going through trouble, it's all about me, 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 me. I don't care what's going on with everyone else. I'm having trouble and everyone needs to pity me. But Jesus is not like that. He doesn't ignore everyone else when he's going through trouble. He thinks of them also and he reminds them to pray. Now verse 41. We 
read of Jesus' agony in the garden. It says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Luke says he knelt. Mark says that he fell to the ground. Matthew says he fell on his face. So he is collapsed on the ground and he starts to pray. And as a side note, big lesson for us is if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, needed to pray in times of trouble, we need to pray also. So Jesus is on the ground and he is more sorrowful than ever, sorrowful to the point of death. So he is deeply distressed, as Matthew and Mark tell us. And he prays. This is his prayer, verse 42. He said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, I remember I was in Proti Gymnasiu and we were having religious lesson, Triskiftika. And my teacher was a big tall guy. Do you remember him who did Triskiftika in a Navisho? Tall, thin guy. You don't <laughs> him. And we were discussing of uh, this passage, the agony of Jesus in Gethsemane. And he actually asked me, he said, Nico, tell us, what is this cup that Jesus is talking about here? What is Jesus afraid of that he is asking God to remove from him? And so I said, um, well, Jesus is, uh, for sure, we know that Jesus is God. Jesus is uh, of the same essence as the Father, He is eternal. We know that Jesus is the Son of God, but nonetheless, He was also a human being. This was my answer. I said, He was also a human being, and in His humanity, He was afraid. He was afraid of the cross, and He was afraid of death. And the teacher said to me, very good, correct, and we moved on. Now, that was not correct. I was wrong, and so was he. Okay? Listen. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus says to his disciples, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. Be af fear him who, after killing the body, can send you to hell. Alright? Do not fear people who all they can do is kill the body and nothing more. So do you think that Jesus saying to his disciples that they shouldn't fear death and they shouldn't fear people, you think Jesus feared people? You think Jesus feared death? There have been martyrs over the past 2,000 years of the church who went to their deaths singing hymns to God who were crucified, singing hymns to God that they, praising God that they were, had been found worthy to die for Christ. Are we to expect that Jesus was less brave, the captain of our salvation was less brave and was afraid of dying more than common people? I think not. So, what is Jesus talking about? What is this cup that he is asking the Father to remove. Now, some have suggested, I'm not agreeing with this, I'm just saying, some have suggested that the cup is the suffering that Jesus is going through at that moment. That Jesus is praying that this suffering that he's going through should be removed. That he's actually praying that he doesn't die from sorrow right now so that he can get to the cross. Following me? Some people say that he is praying that he won't have a premature death. So he says, take this cup from me so that I can survive and get to the cross. Now that sounds interesting, but that's wrong also. Uh, it's wrong because in John chapter 18, after Jesus has gone through this suffering, after he's gone through this entire ordeal, after he's been strengthened by the angel, and they come to arrest him, 
Uh, and, you know, Peter gets the sword out and goes, cuts the guy's ear off. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, put your sword in, into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? So the cup that he's supposed to drink hasn't happened yet. He's still waiting to have it after the suffering in Gethsemane. So that's not what it is. Something that's coming later. So what is the cup? It's not a Roman cross. That's not what he's afraid of. If we go through the Old Testament repeatedly, repeatedly, we see God using the cup as a symbol of judgment of the wrath of God. The cup of the fury and the wrath of God poured out upon sin. Let me read you just a couple of passages. There's plenty that we could go through. Isaiah 51 says, Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of His fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. Psalm 75 says, For in the hand of the Lord is a cup, and the wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. And you would say, wait a minute, Nico, wait. Here it says that the wicked are supposed to drink the cup of the wrath of God. Why did Jesus die? He died in the place of the wicked. What does 2 Corinthians 5.21 say? We need to learn this passage. For God took him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we in him may become the righteousness of God. What happens on the cross is God the Father deals with Jesus as though he had lived my life. The wrath of of God that I deserve for my sin is poured out upon Jesus. That's what happens at the cross. In Deuteronomy 21, it says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And in Galatians chapter 3, Paul quotes that and applies it to Jesus. And he says, yep, that's what happened to Jesus. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And you're like, he didn't just call Jesus cursed, did he? He is saying the curse that you deserve for your sin was put upon Christ. Jesus, the, the wages of sin is death. Jesus didn't sin. Why did he need to die? He dies the death that you deserve to die, that I deserve to die for our sins. Every, think about this. Every sin that the elect of God have ever committed in the history of the world, the punishment that each one of you deserves, the punishment that I deserve, the punishment that Adam deserved, the punishment that every child of God from the beginning of the world to the end of the world deserved, that's a lot of sins. That's billions, trillions, quadrillion sins. And the punishment for them was all poured out upon Jesus at the cross. Jesus from all eternity had perfect communion with the Father, love. And now the Father is going to turn his back on him and pour out his wrath upon him. And Jesus thinks about this and just recoils in horror of the thought that the Father would turn His back on Him, that he, would, that he would be made to be sin and punished. And He shrinks back at the thought and says, Take this cup from me! He's not afraid of a Roman cross. He's not afraid of Roman soldiers. He's afraid of the wrath of God. He knows God. He is God. He knows what the wrath of God is. And that is the horror that Jesus sees in front of Him. And is afraid. But. But. Jesus does not say. Take this cup from me no matter what. I don't care what happens. He doesn't say that. There's a huge disclaimer stuck on this. He says take this cup from me. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Not my will. 
but your will be done. He says, take this cup from me if it is your will. If it's not your will, don't take it. Even though he is repulsed by the idea that he will become sin and be punished for that, he submits to the will of the Father. Is there any other way for sinners to be saved? Is there any other way for sin to be forgiven? Answer, no. Okay, so we're going through with it. If there was some other way, trust me, the Father would not give His only begotten Son. But there is no other way. Why did the Father give the Son? Why did the Son agree to do this? Because there is no other way of salvation. God is a perfect judge. And sin must be punished. If God did not punish sin, He would not be a good judge. If God did not punish sin, He would be unjust. That, this is what good judges do. They punish criminals. If someone did a, an awful crime to someone that you loved, and we took them to court, and the judge said, Oh, that's okay, we'll just let him go. You would be horrified. It would be a scandal. God is not like that. God has to punish sin. But in His love, He sends Jesus Christ to pay for your sins in your place as your substitute. There's two ways that, go, that sin is going to be punished. Every sin that has ever been committed in the history of the world will be punished. Because God is just. But there's two places where sin is punished. One, in hell for eternity where we can pay for our sins. Or, at the cross of Jesus Christ where He paid for our sins in our place. Those are the options. Jesus, knowing what is about to happen, is on the ground, crying, praying. His strength has failed him. So in verse 43, it says that an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. We don't read of angels that much in the life of Jesus. We read about angels at his birth, and we read about angels at his resurrection. But during that time, you don't read about angels that much. You actually read about them twice. Once in his temptation in the wilderness, the angels came and ministered to him. And one more time here in his temptation in the garden. And it doesn't say, it doesn't say how the angel strengthened him, what the angel did. Um, we know from Hebrews 1 that angels are ministering spirits. They don't just uh, go about doing whatever they feel like. They are sent by God. And so, if I could venture a guess, don't throw anything at me. This is just a guess. Um, I would think that the Father sent this angel to just affirm his love and his care for Christ. That this is the right thing to do. But I don't know. I don't know how he strengthened him. Verse 44 says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He's been crying, sweating. Uh, really quick, most commentators that I read, read this passage and they say, Oh, Jesus' blood became great drops of blood and they start getting very scientific and start giving all kinds of medical terms and they say when, you, when a body goes through severe stress what happens is some of the blood vessels can burst and come out of your pores and I'm like well it doesn't say that his blood that his sweat became blood it says it became like great drops of blood but falling to the ground nonetheless verse 45 when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. It's late at night, so it would be understandable if they were tired. And they've had a big meal, so it would be understandable if they were drowsy, but that's not the reason they're sleeping. It says the reason. They're sleeping from sorrow. Some of us can understand that. You know, sometimes when you're very distressed and sad, you just want to sleep. You don't want to do anything because, you know, just numb the pain. Stop thinking about my problems. Maybe when I wake up, it'll all be gone. 
And so they're really sad with everything that they've heard and you know, about betrayal and death and all kinds of things that are going to happen. So they're just sleeping. Verse 46. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Now they, they couldn't handle the events of this night, so they'd rather just sleep. Maybe things will be better in the morning. But uh, Jesus didn't sleep. He told them to pray. And he was strengthened at this point. The disciples are not ready for what's about to happen. They are not. Uh, but Jesus is now prepared and he is ready to go to the cross. And we will see him be arrested next week. Um, to close, to close, let me just give you th three quick lessons from our text. Number one, if Jesus needed to pray, Jesus, the God-man, the Lord of glory, needed to pray, we must absolutely pray. We do not have any strength on our own. We need Him every hour. Second of all, our prayers need to be like Jesus' prayers. Jesus didn't say, I want this. He said, your will be done, not mine. This is how our prayers should be. It's not about what I want. It's not about what my family may want me to do. It's not about what the world wants me to do. It's not about what is most popular. It, look, I'm not, when I die, I'm not going to stand in front of any of you to give an account. I'm going to stand in front of Christ to give an account. And so are you. And so it's not about what I want, not about what you want, it's about what God wants. It's about doing His will. And we must seek His will and pray for His will to be done and not ours. That doesn't mean that things are going to go easy. That does not mean that things will be easy. Jesus prayed, your will be done, and He was arrested and killed. But He did God's will. This doesn't mean that things are going to be easy, but... Obeying God and following His will is the path to true blessing. So number one, we need to pray. Number two, we need to pray that God's will be done. And that's what we pray when we do the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And third, always, always remember the great price that Christ paid for us suffered and died in our place. And so let's forever glorify Him for that. Never forget it. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.